the 2021 CCNA Synapse Award, we're proposing a study looking at cerebral blood flow, mobility, and mild cognitive impairment. As proportion of older adults increases globally, age-related health problems are becoming an important public health concern. Worldwide, approximately 50 million people are living with dementia, with projected numbers reaching 75 million by 2030 and 123 million by 2050. And there's a growing amount of evidence suggesting an association between cognitive impairment and reduced cerebral blood flow. As we can see on the graph on the left-hand side, as MMSE scores decrease, cerebral blood flow also decreases. And it's theorized that the vascular pathology of cerebral blood flow may even contribute to the development of dementia. Yet the prevailing body of research has been completed in the supine position. And that's when the brain and the heart are within the same horizontal plane. We see this in studies mostly with brain scanners. So studies looking at SPEC, uh, PET, MRI, and ASL. However, during dynamic movements, such as going from lying down to standing up or while walking, the cardiovascular and cerebrovascular systems are challenged by gravitational forces that are redistributing the blood volume to the active muscle beds. So assessing cerebral blood flow during these dynamic movements may expose adults who are more susceptible to cerebral hypoperfusion or lower blood flow in a way that cannot be achieved in the static supine posture. Therefore, we're aiming to fill this gap in the literature by assessing cerebral blood flow during dynamic movements in people with MCI. The effects of prolonged supine rest on an immediate upright posture are substantial, wherein large drops in blood pressure and cerebral blood flow are seen upon assuming the upright posture. As we can see in the graph, negative time represents supine rest and positive time represents standing. Upon standing, blood pressure in the blue tracing and cerebral blood flow velocity in the dashed gray tracing transiently drop until they hit an adhere value and then they typically recover within 30 seconds of standing. However, in 20% of community dwelling older adults, cerebral oxygenation does not fully recover. And in these same older adults, they demonstrate a large enough postural reduction in cerebral oxygenation to negatively impact postural stability a known predictor of falls in older adults. Older adults without any known cognitive impairments who have lower cerebral oxygenation while walking also demonstrate slower gait speeds and increased gait step-to-step -step variability, which are both predictors of future falls in older adults. Here we have some preliminary data of a supine to, to walking transition where negative time represents supine rest and positive time represents walking. In the preliminary data, there are two individuals. One is an individual with higher cerebral blood flow and oxygenation in the filled circles and black bars. And we have a second individual with lower cerebral blood flow and oxygenation in the open circles and gray bars. When we look at the raw summation and filter data from the three-axis accelerometer for the two corresponding participants, we can see how gait speed differs between these two individuals, as well as gait characteristics, such as gait cycle variability during the first and last 20 seconds of a one-minute walk test. What is noteworthy is that although cerebral autoregulation differs between the two participants at baseline, cerebral blood flow velocity does not differ between these two individuals during supine rest. However, once walking, we see differences beginning to emerge. With the majority of waking hours occupied by activities in the upright posture, some people may be intermittently unprotected against transient or potentially chronic bouts of cerebral hypoperfusion, which may accelerate the decline of cognitive function. Therefore, we propose to assess the functional aspects of cerebral blood flow during a supine to standing transition and during walking in an effort to flag adults with mild cognitive impairment who may be more susceptible to reduce cerebral blood flow during activities in the upright position. Specifically, the aims of this study are to identify if there is a subgroup of people with mild cognitive impairment who have reduced cerebral blood flow and oxygenation during activities in the upright position. Also, does this subgroup of older adults with mild cognitive impairment have poor postural stability or gait abnormalities? And is cognitive decline associated with cerebral hypoperfusion? We plan to tackle this question with an interdisciplinary approach. 
The current research objectives combine aspects of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular hemodynamics with postural stability and gait dynamics. Our approach hinges on the collaboration between two CCNA teams. Team 7 will leverage its clinical expertise in vascular illness and its impact on neurodegenerative disease to recruit patients and quantify levels of neurodegeneration and blood pressure responses. Team 12 will provide its expertise in mobility, exercise, and cognition by assessing dynamic properties during posture changes and implementing the no novel Windkessel analysis developed by Dr. Kevin Shoemaker. This integrative approach will specifically target the simultaneous assessment of cerebrovascular hemodynamics during mobility and exercise in adults with mild cognitive impairment, which will be a flagship study in assessing the links between dynamic changes in cerebral blood flow and mild cognitive impairment. To date, Western University has enrolled over 200 participants, the highest number nationally in the CCNA database. This project will exploit access to this dataset to explore a potential disease-modifying mechanism of dementia. With a target sample size of 70 participants and testing several participants per week, we anticipate to achieve this goal by mid-December. We will, we will be collecting data with five different mobile devices, including transcranial Doppler ultrasound, near-infrared spectroscopy, end tidal carbon dioxide gas analyzer, a balance board, and three accelerometers. This amount of data will require two to three months for data processing. Following this, one month will be used for statistical analysis and one month for assembling findings and figures. We will also complete novel analyses developed by Dr. Shoemaker to estimate cerebrovascular compliance using a MATLAB-based program. This software uses a four-element Windkessel model to match predicted and measured cerebral blood flow waveforms by performing up to a thousand iterations in order to, de to, to determine the lowest error value. This process will require two to three months of data analysis as well. We have four concrete ways in which we plan to facilitate knowledge translation. The first is dissemination in scientific journals. We aim to submit at least two papers for peer review publication. And target journals include the Journal of Alzheimer's Association, the Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism, and the Journal of Gerontology Medical Sciences. We also present findings at international conferences such as the Canadian Geriatric Society and American Society of Geriatrics, as well as the Alzheimer's Association. Our local presentations will feature the Parkwood Institute Research Day and the CCNA Annual Meeting. The CCNA has also embedded a knowledge translation and exchange pillar in their structure, which we will leverage. This includes dissemination of the information directly to patients and caregivers affected by dementia through high visibility webinars, public events, and videos posted on their website and shared with organizations such as the Alzheimer's Society. With a network of over 250 health professionals, there's a large infrastructure which, we will, which will allow dissemination among healthcare providers. Finally, Public seminars will be given by investigators through connections already established with various academic and clinical institutions in Europe, such as the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior, as well as the USA, for instance, the Marcus Institute for Aging Research. We will use these platforms to disseminate findings from the study directly to various clinicians and research groups who have a similar focus on cerebral blood flow dynamics, mobility, and cognition. The literature implies a close relationship between low cerebral blood flow and cognitive decline, yet no study has quantitatively assessed these relationships during activities known to cause cerebral hypoperfusion. By determining the prevalence of decreased dynamic cerebral blood flow and gait abnormalities in a community-dwelling older cohort with mild cognitive impairment, we can provide evidence for studying cerebral blood flow in greater detail in patients with mild cognitive impairment. The big picture is for us to establish whether decreased cerebral blood flow is associated with accelerated cognitive decline, and we can uncover an important clinical risk factor that may be amendable for future treatment. Our long-term goal is to develop a greater understanding of the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms associated with mild cognitive impairment, and our hope is that the gathered data from this study will be applied to future treatment studies. Will you help our team uncover these questions?